Part the Second, The Papyrus, Section One, of Thais by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part the Second, Section One. Thais was born of free but poor parents who were idolaters. When she was a very little girl, her father kept at Alexandria, near the Gate of the Moon, an inn, which was frequented by sailors. She still retained some vivid but disconnected memories of her early youth. She remembered her father, seated at the corner of the hearth with his legs crossed, tall, formidable, and quiet, like one of those old pharaohs who are celebrated in the ballads sung by the blind men at the street corners. She remembered also her thin, wretched mother, wandering like a hungry cat about the house, which she filled with the tones of her sharp voice and the glitter of her phosphorescent eyes. They said in the neighborhood that she was a witch, and changed into an owl at night and flew to see her lovers. It was a lie. Thais knew well, having often watched her, that her mother practiced no magic arts, but that she was eaten up with avarice, and counted all night the gains of the day. The idle father and the greedy mother let the child live as best it could, like one of the fowls in the poultry yard. She became very clever in extracting, one by one, the oboli from the belt of some drunken sailor, and in amusing the drinkers with artless songs and obscene words, the meaning of which she did not know. She passed from knee to knee in a room reeking with the odors of fermented drinks and resiny wineskins. Then, her cheeks sticky with beer and pricked by rough beards, she escaped, clutching the oboli in her little hand, and ran to buy honey cakes from an old woman who crouched behind her baskets under the gate of the moon. Every day the same scenes were repeated the sailors relating their perilous adventures, then playing at dice or knuckle-bones, and blaspheming the gods, amid their shouting for the best beer of Cilicia. Every night the child was awakened by the quarrels of the drunkards. Oyster-shells would fly across tables, cutting the heads of those they hit, and the uproar was terrible. Sometimes she saw, by the light of the smoky lamps, the knives glitter and the blood flow. It humiliated her to think that the only person who showed her any human kindness in her young days was the mild and gentle Alms. Alms, the house slave, a Nubian blacker than the pot he gravely skimmed, was as good as a long night's sleep. Often he would take Thais on his knee and tell her old tales about underground treasure houses constructed for avarice kings who put to death the masons and architects. There were also tales about clever thieves who married kings' daughters and courtesans who built pyramids. Little Thais loved Ams like a father, like a mother, like a nurse, and like a dog. She followed the slave into the cellar when he went to fill the amphorae, and into the poultry yard amongst the scraggy and ragged fowls, all beak, claws, and feathers, who flew swifter than eagles before the knife of the black cook. Often at night, on the straw, instead of sleeping, he built for Thais little watermills and ships no bigger than his hand, with all their rigging. He had been badly treated by his masters. One of his ears was torn, and his body was covered with scars. Yet his features always wore an air of joyous peace, and no one ever asked him whence he drew the consolation in his soul and the peace in his heart. He was as simple as a child. As he performed his heavy tasks, he sang, in a harsh voice, hymns, which made the child tremble and dream. He murmured in a gravely joyous tone, Tell us, Mary, what thou hast seen, where thou hast been. I saw the shroud in the linen clothes, and the angel seated on the tomb, and I saw the glory of the risen one. She asked him, Father, why do you sing about angels seated on a tomb? And he replied, Little light of my eyes, I sing of the angels because Jesus our Lord is risen to heaven. 
Ams was a Christian. He had been baptized and was known as Theodore at the meetings of the faithful, to which he went secretly during the hours allowed him for sleep. At that time the church was suffering the severest trials. By order of the emperor the churches had been thrown down, the holy books burned, the sacred vessels and candlesticks melted. The Christians had been deprived of all their honors and expected nothing but death. Terror reigned over all the community at Alexandria, and the prisons were crammed with victims. It was whispered with horror among the faithful that in Syria, in Arabia, in Mesopotamia, in Cappadocia, in all the empire, bishops and virgins had been flogged, tortured, crucified, or thrown to wild beasts. Then Antony, already celebrated for his visions and his solitary life, a prophet, and the head of all the Egyptian believers, descended like an eagle from his desert rock on the city of Alexandria, and, flying from church to church, fired the whole community with his holy ardor. Invisible to the pagans, he was present at the same time at all the meetings of Christians, endowed all with the spirit of strength and prudence by which he was animated. Slaves in particular were persecuted with singular severity. Many of them, seized with fright, denied the faith. Others, and by far the greater number, fled to the desert, hoping to live there, either as hermits or robbers. Alms, however, frequented the meetings as usual, visited the prisoners, buried the martyrs, and joyfully professed the religion of Christ. The great Anthony, who saw his unshaken zeal, before he returned into the desert, pressed the black slave in his arms and gave him the kiss of peace. When Thais was seven years old, Alms began to talk to her of God. The good Lord God, he said, lived in heaven like a pharaoh, under the tents of his harem, and under the trees of his gardens. He was the ancient of ancients, and older than the world, and he had but one son, the prince Jesus, whom he loved with all his heart, and who surpassed in beauty the virgins and the angels. And the good Lord God said to Prince Jesus, Leave my harem and my place, and my date trees and my running waters. Descend to earth for the welfare of men." There thou shalt be like a little child, and thou shalt live poor amongst the poor. Suffering shall be thy daily bread, and thou shalt weep so profusely that thy tears shall form rivers in which the tired slave shall bathe with delight. Go, my son. Prince Jesus obeyed the good Lord, and he came down to earth to a place named Bethlehem of Judea, and he walked in fields amidst the flowering anemones, saying to his companion, Blessed are they who hunger, for I will lead them to the Father's table. Blessed are they who thirst, for they shall drink of the fountains of heaven. Blessed are they who weep, for I will dry their tears with veils finer than those of the almes. That is why the poor loved him and believed in him, but the rich hated him, fearing that he should raise the poor above them. At that time, Cleopatra and Caesar were powerful on the earth. They both hated Jesus, and they ordered the judges and priests to put him to death. To obey the queen of Egypt, the princes of Syria erected a cross on a high mountain, and they caused Jesus to die on this cross. But women washed his corpse and buried it, and Prince Jesus, having broken the door of his tomb, rose again to the good Lord, his Father. And from that time all those who believed in him go to heaven. The Lord God opens his arms and says to them, Ye are welcome, because ye love the Prince, my son. Wash, and then eat. 
They bathe to the sound of beautiful music, and all the time they are eating they see Alma's dancing, and they listen to tales that never end. They are dearer to the good Lord than the light of his eyes, because they are his guests, and they shall have for their portion the carpets of his house and the pomegranates of his gardens. Ams often spoke in this strain, and thus taught the truth to Thais. She wondered, and said, I should like to eat the pomegranates of the good Lord. Alms replied, Only those who are baptized may taste the fruits of heaven. And Thais asked to be baptized. Seeing by this that she believed in Jesus, the slave resolved to instruct her more fully, so that, being baptized, she might enter the church. And he loved her as his spiritual daughter. The child, unloved and uncared for by its selfish parents, had no bed in the house. She slept in a corner of the stable amongst the domestic animals, and there Ams came to her every night, secretly. He gently approached the mat on which she lay, and sat down on his heels, his legs bent and his body straight, a position hereditary to his race. His face and his body, which was clothed in black, were invisible in the darkness, but his big white eyes shone out, and there came from them a light like a ray of dawn through the chinks of a door. He spoke in a husky, monotonous tone, with a slight nasal twang that gave it the soft melody of music heard at night in the streets. Sometimes the breathing of an ass or the soft lowing of an ox accompanied, like a chorus of invisible spirits, the voice of the slave as he recited the Gospels. His words flowed gently in the darkness, which they filled with zeal, mercy, and hope. And the neophyte, her hand in that of alms, lulled by the monotonous sounds, and the vague visions in her mind slept calm and smiling amid the harmonies of the dark night and the holy mysteries, gazed down on by a star, which twinkled between the joists of the stable roof. The initiation lasted a whole year, till the time when the Christians joyfully celebrate the festival of Easter. One night, in the Holy Week, Thais, who was already asleep on her mat, felt herself lifted by the slave, whose eyes gleamed with a strange light. He was clad, not as usual, in a pair of torn drawers, but in a long white cloak, beneath which he pressed the child, whispering to her, Come, my soul, come, light of my eyes, come, little sweetheart, come and be clad in the baptismal robes. He carried the child pressed to his breast. Frightened and yet curious, Thais, her head out of the cloak, threw her arms around her friend's neck, and he ran with her through the darkness. They went down the narrow black alleys, they passed through the Jews' quarter, they skirted a cemetery, where the osprey uttered its dismal cry. They traversed an open space, passing under crosses, on which hung the bodies of victims, and on the arms of the crosses the ravens clacked their beaks. Thais hid her head in the slave's breast. She did not dare peep out all the rest of the way. Soon it seemed to her that she was going down underground. When she reopened her eyes, she found herself in a narrow cave, lighted by resin torches, on the walls of which were painted standing figures, which seemed to move and live in the flickering glare of the torches. They were men clad in long tunics and carrying branches of palm, and around them were lambs, doves, and tendrils of vine. Amongst these figures, Thais recognized Jesus of Nazareth by the anemones flowering at his feet. In the center of the cave, near a large stone font filled with water, stood an old man clad in a scarlet dalmatic, embroidered with gold, and on his head a low mitre. His thin face ended in a long beard. He looked gentle and humble, in spite of his rich costume. This was Bishop Vivantius, an exiled dignitary of the Church of Cyrene, who now gained his livelihood by weaving common stuffs of goat's hair. 
two poor children stood by his side. Close by, an old negress unfolded a little white robe. Alms set the child down on the ground, and kneeling before the bishop, said, Father, this is the little soul, the child of my soul. I have brought her to you that you may, according to your promise, and if it please your holiness, bestow on her the baptism of life. At these words the bishop opened his arms and showed his mutilated hands. His nails had been torn out because he had maintained the faith in the days of persecution. Thais was frightened and threw herself into the arms of Alms, but the kind words of the priest reassured her. Fear nothing, dearly beloved little one. Thou hast here a spiritual father, Alms, who is called Theodore amongst the faithful, and a kind mother in grace, who has prepared for thee with her own hands a white robe. And turning toward the negress, she is called Nitida, he added, and is a slave in this world, but in heaven she will be a spouse of Jesus. Then he said to the child neophyte, Thais, dost thou believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in his holy Son, who died for our salvation, and in all the apostles taught? Yes, replied together the negro and negress, who held her by each hand. By the bishop's order, Natita knelt down and undressed Thais. The child was quite naked. Round her neck was an amulet. The pontiff plunged her three times into the baptismal font. The acolytes brought the oil with which Vivantius anointed the catechumen, and the salt, a morsel of which he placed on her tongue. Then, having dried that body which was destined, after many trials, to life immortal, the slave Natidia put on Thais the white robe she had woven. The bishop gave to each and all the kiss of peace, and the ceremony, being terminated, took off his sacerdotal insignia. When they had left the crypt, Am said, We ought to rejoice that we have this day brought a soul to the good Lord God. Let us go to the house of your holiness and spend the rest of the night in rejoicing. Thou hast well said, Theodore, replied the bishop, and he led the little band to his house, which was quite near. It consisted of a single room, furnished with a couple of looms, a heavy table, and a worn-out carpet. As soon as they had entered, Natidia, cried the Nubian, bring hither the stove and the jar of oil, and we will have a good supper. Saying thus, he drew from under his cloak some little fish which he had kept concealed, and lighted a fire and fried them. The bishop, the girl, the two boys, and the two slaves sat in a ring on the carpet, ate the fried fish, and blessed the Lord. Vivantius spoke of the torture he had undergone, and prophesied the speedy triumph of the church. His language was grotesque and full of wordplay and rhetorical tropes. He compared the life of the just to a tissue of purple, and to explain the mystery of baptism, he said, the divine spirit floated on the waters, and that is why Christians receive the baptism of water. But demons also inhabit the brooks. Springs consecrated to nymphs are especially dangerous, and there are certain waters which cause various maladies, both of the soul and of the body. Sometimes he spoke enigmatically, and the child listened to him with profound awe and wonder. At the end of the repast he offered his guests a little wine, and this unloosed their tongues, and they began to sing lamentations and hymns. Alms and Nitida then rose and danced a Nubian dance, which they had learned as children, and which, no doubt, had been danced by their tribe since the early stages of the world. It was a love dance. Waving their arms and moving their bodies in rhythmic measure, they feigned in turn to fly from and to pursue each other. Their big eyes rolled, and they showed their gleaming teeth and broad grins. In this strange manner did Thais receive the holy rite of baptism. She loved amusements, and as she grew, vague desires were created in her mind. 
All day long she danced and sang with the children in the streets, and when at night she returned to her father's house, she was still singing. Crooked twist, why do you stay in the house? I comb the wool and the malatin threads. Crooked twist, what did your son die of? He fell from the white horses into the sea. She now began to prefer the company of boys and girls to that of the gentle and quiet Ams. She did not notice that her friend was not so often with her. The persecution having relented, the Christians were able to assemble more regularly, and the Nubian frequented these meetings assiduously. His zeal increased, and he sometimes uttered mysterious threats. He said that the rich would not keep their wealth. He went to the public places to which the poor Christians used to resort, and assembling together all the poor wretches who were lying in the shade of the old walls, he announced to them that all slaves would soon be free, and that the day of justice was at hand. In the kingdom of God, he said, the slaves will drink new wine and eat delicious fruits, whilst the rich, crouching at their feet like dogs, will devour the crumbs from their table. These sayings were noised abroad through all that quarter of the city, and the masters feared that alms might incite the slaves to revolt. The innkeeper hated him intensely, though he carefully concealed his rancor. One day a silver salt cellar, reserved for the table of the gods, disappeared from the inn. Alms was accused of having stolen it, out of hate to his master and to the gods of the empire. There was no proof of the accusation, and the slave vehemently denied the charge. Nevertheless, he was dragged before the tribunal, and as he had the reputation of being a bad servant, the judge condemned him to death. "'As you did not know how to make good use of your hands,' he said, "'they will be nailed to the cross.' Ahms heard the verdict quietly, bowed to the judge most respectfully, and was taken to the public prison. During the three days that remained to him, he did not cease to preach the gospel to the prisoners, and it was related afterwards that the criminals and the jailer himself, touched by his words, believed in Jesus crucified. He was taken to the very place which one night, less than two years before, he had crossed so joyfully carrying in his cloak little Thais, the daughter of his soul, his darling flower. When his hands were nailed to the cross, he uttered no complaint, but many times he sighed and murmured, I thirst. His agony lasted three days and three nights. It seemed hardly possible that human flesh could have endured such prolonged torture. Many times it was thought he was dead. The flies clustered on his eyelids, but suddenly he would reopen his bloodshot eyes. On the morning of the fourth day he sang, in a voice clearer and purer than that of a child. Tell us, Mary, what thou hast seen and where thou hast been. Then he smiled and said, They come, the angels of the good Lord, they bring me wine and fruit. How refreshing is the fanning of their wings. And he expired. His features preserved in death an expression of ecstatic happiness. Even the soldiers who guarded the cross were struck with wonder. Vivantius, accompanied by some of the Christian brethren, claimed the body and buried it with the remains of the other martyrs in the crypt of St. John the Baptist, and the church venerated the memory of St. Theodore the Nubian. Three years later, Constantine, the conqueror of Maxentius, issued an edict which granted toleration to the Christians, and the believers were not henceforth persecuted, except by heretics. Thais had completed her eleventh year when her friend was tortured to death, and she felt deeply saddened and shocked. 
Her soul was not sufficiently pure to allow her to understand that the slave Alms was blessed both in his life and his death. The idea sprang up in her little mind that no one can be good in this world except at the cost of the most terrible sufferings. And she was afraid to be good, for her delicate flesh could not bear pain. At an early age she had given herself to the lads about the port, and she followed the old men who wandered about the quarter in the evening, and with what she received from them she bought cakes and trinkets. As she did not take home any of the money she gained, her mother continually ill-treated her. To get out of reach of her mother's arms, she often ran, barefooted, to the city walls and hid with the lizards. There she thought with envy of the ladies she had seen pass her, richly dressed, and in a litter surrounded by slaves. One day, when she had been beaten more brutally than usual, she was crouching down beside the gate, motionless and sulky, when an old woman stopped in front of her, looked at her for some moments in silence, and then cried, "'Oh, the pretty flower, the beautiful child! Happy is the father who begot thee, and the mother who brought thee into the world!' Thais remained silent with her eyes fixed on the ground. Her eyelids were red. It was evident that she had been weeping. "'My white violet,' continued the old woman, "'is not your mother happy to have nourished a little goddess like you? And does not your father, when he sees you, rejoice from the bottom of his heart?' To which the child replied, as though talking to herself, "'My father is a wineskin, swollen with wine, and my mother a greedy horse leech. The old woman glanced to the right and to the left to see if she were observed. Then, in a fawning voice, sweet flowering hyacinth, beautiful drinker of light, come with me, and you shall have nothing to do but dance and smile. I will feed you on honey cakes, and my son, my own son, will love you as his eyes." My son is handsome and young. He has but little beard on his chin, his skin is soft, and he is, as they say, a little Arcanean pig. Thais replied, I am quite willing to go with you. And she rose and followed the old woman out of the city. The old woman, who was named Moreau, went from city to city with a troop of girls and boys whom she taught to dance, and then hired out to rich people to appear at feasts. Guessing that Thais would soon develop into a most beautiful woman, she taught her, with the help of a whip, music, and prosody, and she flogged with leather thongs those beautiful legs, when they did not move in time to the strains of the cythera. Her son, a decrepit abortion of no age and no sex, ill-treated the child, on whom he vented the hate he had for all womankind. Like the dancing girls whose grace he affected, he knew and taught Thais the art of pantomime, and how to mimic by expression, gesture, and attitude all human passions, and more especially the passions of love. He was a clever master, though he disliked his work, but he was jealous of his pupil, and as soon as he discovered that she was born to give men pleasure, he scratched her cheeks, pinched her arms, or pricked her legs as a spiteful girl would have done. Thanks, however, to his lessons, she quickly became an excellent musician, pantomimist, and dancer. The brutality of her master did not at all surprise her. It seemed natural to her to be badly treated. She even felt some respect for the old woman, who knew music and drank Greek wine. Moreau, when she came to Antioch, praised her pupil to the rich merchants of the city, who gave banquets both as a dancer and a flute player. Thais danced and pleased. She accompanied the rich bankers when they left the table into the shady groves on the banks of the Orontes. She gave herself to all, for she knew nothing of the price of love. But one night, 
that she had danced before the most fashionable young men of the city, the son of the proconsul came to her, radiant with youth and pleasure, and said in a voice that seemed redolent of kisses, Why am I not, Thais, the wreath which crowns your hair, the tunic which enfolds your beautiful form, the sandal on your pretty foot? I wish you to tread me underfoot as your sandal. I wish my caresses to be your tunic and your wreath. Come, sweet girl, to my house, and let us forget the world. She looked at him whilst he was speaking, and she saw that he was handsome. Suddenly she felt a cold sweat on her face. She turned green as grass. She reeled. A cloud descended before her eyes. He again implored her to come with him, but she refused. His ardent looks, his burning words, were vain, and when he took her in his arms to try and drag her away, she pushed him off rudely. Then he implored her and shed tears, but a new, unknown, and invincible passion dominated her heart, and still she resisted. What madness, said the guests. Lolius is noble, handsome, and rich, and a dancing girl treats him with scorn. Lolius returned home alone that night, quite lovesick. He came in the morning, pale and red-eyed, and hung flowers at the dancing girl's door. But Thais was frightened and yet troubled. She avoided Lolius, and yet he was continually in her mind. She suffered, and she did not know the cause of her complaint. She wondered why she had thus changed, and why she was melancholy. She recoiled from all her lovers. They were hateful to her. She loathed the light of day, and lay on her bed all night, sobbing, and with her head buried in the pillows. Lolius contrived to gain admittance and came many times, but neither his pleadings nor his execrations had any effect on the obdurate girl. In his presence she was as timid as a virgin, and would say nothing but, I will not, I will not. But at the end of a fortnight she gave in, for she knew that she loved him. She went to his house and lived with him. They were supremely happy. They passed their days shut up together, gazing into each other's eyes and babbling a childish jargon. In the evening, they walked on the lonely banks of the Orontes and lost themselves in the laurel woods. Sometimes they rose at dawn to go and gather hyacinths on the slopes of Sulpicus. They drank from the same cup and he would take a grape from between her lips with his mouth. Moreau came to Lolius and cried and shrieked that Thais should be restored to her. She is my daughter, she said, my daughter who has been torn from me, my perfumed flower, my own bowels. Lolius gave her a large sum of money and sent her away. But as she came back to demand some more gold staters, the young man had her put in prison, and the magistrates, having discovered that she was guilty of many crimes, she was condemned to death and thrown to the wild beasts. Thais loved Lolius with all the passion of her mind and the bewilderment of innocence. She told him, and told him truly from the bottom of her heart, I have never loved any one but you. Lolius replied, You are not like any other woman. The spell lasted six months, but it broke at last. Thais suddenly felt that her heart was empty and lonely. Lolius no longer seemed the same to her. She thought, What can have thus changed me in an instant? How is it that he is now like any other man, and no longer like himself? She left him, not without a secret desire to find Lolius again in another, as she no longer found him in himself. She thought it would be less dull to live with someone else she had never loved, 
than with the one she had ceased to love. She appeared in the company of rich debauchees at those sacred feasts at which naked virgins danced in the temples, and troops of courtesans swam across the Orantes. She took part in all the pleasures of the fashionable and depraved city, and she assiduously frequented the theatres, at which clever mimes from all countries performed amidst the applause of a crowd greedy for excitement. She carefully observed the mimes, dancers, comedians, and especially the women who, in tragedies, represented goddesses in love with young men, or mortals loved by the gods. Having discovered the secrets by which they pleased the audience, she thought to herself that she was more beautiful and could act better. She went to the manager and asked to be admitted into the troupe. Thanks to her beauty and to the lessons she had received from old Moreau, she was received and appeared on the stage in the part of Dearce. She met with but indifferent success, for she was inexperienced, and the admiration of the spectators had not been aroused by hearing her praises sung. But after she had played small parts for a few months, the power of her beauty burst forth with such effect that all the city was moved. All Antioch crowded to the theater. The imperial magistrates and the chief citizens were compelled by the force of public opinion to show themselves there. The porters, sweepers, and dock laborers went without bread and garlic that they might pay for their places. Poets composed epigrams in her honor. Bearded philosophers invade against her in the baths and gymnasia. When her litter passed, Christian priests turned away their heads. The threshold of her door was wreathed with flowers and sprinkled with blood. She received so much money from her lovers that it was no longer counted, but measured by the minimness and all the treasure hoarded by miserly old men was poured out at her feet. But she was placid and unmoved. She rejoiced with quiet pride in the admiration of the public and the favor of the gods, and was so much loved that she loved herself. End of Part the Second, Section 1